out of the four competitors in Champions League are out, we're officially in crisis, Oscar. Uh, I guess you can say that. <laughs> but the uh, thing is that, I mean, we saw two out of the three coming, to be in all honesty. So I don't think anyone should have been too shocked that Sevilla went out despite a too little, too late effort and Barcelona went out because you know, Inter had the easy job of taking care of Victoria Pilsen and then the kickoff. Atleti is the one where everyone is like, you know, sort of knew this would happen because it's Atleti, they, they love drama. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and it was very dramatic. And we, we have Adura here, who's a Valencia fan. We brought him in here because obviously this is a crazy week in Spanish football. And Adura, like, do you, what do you think about this? The fact that for the first time since we went to this format, we have only one Spanish team in the last 16. Mm, I think, as, as, as Oscar said, yeah, it's, it's not a surprise to people that have been following the league. Um, I think Sevilla's downfall was expected. Atletico, not so much. And Barca just happens to be very unlucky to be put in the same group as Inter Milan and Bayern. Well, as, as most people would have expected Barca to have come over Inter. But to our surprise, Xavi, Xavi did not have any plan for that. And it's, and it's very surprising because it, an European championship is... Yeah, and Spanish and um, footholds or the strongholds, we should be performing in these competitions and not going down so early. Yeah. I think Sevilla might not be the best representative of the Spanish league at the Champions League. Probably the Europa League is better for them, you know, and all that. But over next next season, I think La Liga should get a better um, this representative there. Probably Real Betis or whoever qualifies. Yeah. I think I'm counting Villarreal out of that now. Yeah. Uh, that's harsh. <laughs> uh, that's harsh, but I, I kind of agree with him. Like, so we have, honestly, I don't even think they'll do well in the Europa League the way they're going. But yeah, they're they're bottom in the league, right? Uh, only yeah. bottom three in the league right now. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. what I'm expecting. I think next season, like someone like Javi will hopefully grow and learn his lesson. Simeone will. Simeone is an experienced and great manager. I hope he'll learn his lesson too. And I think I don't think Spanish will be like because now Twitter and everyone likes to say, oh, this is the end of everything. I don't think is that that's the case. I just feel like some clubs need to learn their lesson and just improve how they play in Europe. Yeah, yeah, because this happened to the German clubs last season where it was only Bayern that stayed in the competition after this period, but now they could have like four teams go through. But is it is it is there a problem tactically with Spanish football? Because we are seeing Real Madrid play a different way and they're successful in terms of their playing style in Europe. But out of the other three, since Max Day won, each of them only have one win. The other three representatives, is there an issue with it? And I can understand Barcelona's group because Barcelona have Inter and Bayern Munich, as we've all discussed. Very difficult. They had those injuries to their center backs. Three of their starting center backs went down. Unbelievable bad luck for them. Sevilla, the crisis. Atleti, though, is the one I want to narrow in on because this is a team that you expect more for. When the group came out of, we all discussed with each other and we all said that they were going to make this difficult for themselves. And it's not, it's not too much of a surprise that they're out because they've always been struggling in the Champions League at this round. And eventually, after playing with Pyre, they've finally been burnt. Uh, yeah, I feel like definitely out of all three of them, you have to look at look to Atleti to change how they play in Europe. And 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 I don't think Simeone should leave or anything. I just feel like remember the season they won the league and he brought this new innovation and they looked sharper, they looked hungrier, they looked more attacking, and they've kind of gone away from that for a very a lot of reasons. So I feel. They should get back to that. Whether it's personal, I think personal changes are needed among the players. First, Sevilla or anyone else who is coming, I feel like Spanish teams have the same problem of being too horizontally sideways, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. Of being too horizontal. I feel like they need to they need to just improve, like try and be a bit more direct because 
in Europe, teams will kill you quickly, and that's just the style now. Yeah, can, can I be a bit partial with Spanish teams? Because I feel horizontal is not the right word. I would rather use they've been so lethargic in the European Champions League. Yeah, yeah, yeah that play, is better. Because watching them play, it's almost like they feel they're not excited to be in that competition. They don't play with that enthusiasm to want to prove something in Europe. Like, you look at the way Club Brugge played in the group, the way Inter played, Dortmund in some cases, they seem like teams that were super excited to be there. They're super hungry to prove a point. And you look at the way Atleti played, and it's like, oh, it's like they're just flipping their fixture list. We're going to get through this anyways. And I feel that sort of hurts a lot of the Spanish teams because Real Madrid are the only team that I feel in Europe play like, okay, this is our competition to win. We're here to prove a point. And we don't really see that from Spanish teams anymore, in my opinion. Adora, do you have any points on that? Yeah, I, I think I think Atleti, Atleti's problem was the problem of undermining their opponents or the or the people they faced in their group stage. Because the first legs against Club Rouge, Porto, they did not really take the fights in those in those games. They did not really push, they did not really go like as if they wanted to they wanted the wins or they were a serious team. You know, like the last game at the Wanda Metropolitan, we, we, we could see the athletes that we were used to. We saw the athletes that we were used to at the dying minutes of the game, fighting for that win, fighting for, for, for the points and, and the important things. But it was late, late, the last, the last game of the group stage. Yeah. What, what, what do you expect to get from that after playing the first, the first five games in, um, in, this, in, in a lazy manner? Yeah. There, there, was, there was nothing that they could have done. There was no. They were just so unlucky with penalty miss at the diamonds at the end of the game. Yeah, they were very unlucky. Yeah, and you can say the same thing for what happens to them this weekend against Cadet, in that they start with the same lethargic performance. They finally created some chances, but up until Cadet were tuning up, you never really saw Atleti really pressure. But after Cadet went tuning up, Joe Felix, we've been critical of him in this podcast, but at this man, the difference. <laughs> Yeah, Cad- 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 I was like, first the young girl with a great basket, with a good basket, kick and score. I'm like, ah, these are his boys. Yeah. But yeah, this Cadiz Athletic game was a strange one because Cad Athletic have always dealt with Cadiz since Cadiz came up. So when they were win- winning one, I was always like, okay, Athletic will win this one. Then the game just goes crazy in the last ten minutes. You have Cadiz making it two 0 let you make it two two and then somehow still lose and like this is the same too little too late team that we usually get with Atleti and yeah you, and they need to change that honestly yeah and and it's not you just know, that, it's season, funny it's because, because yeah oh, go it's on, funny Andrew. because that, that that was exactly the same thing Atleti did last season yeah play the full ninety minutes lazy doing nothing then they get ninety plus they get at the eight additional minutes then come back and win the game in the eight additional minutes. Cadiz played the same game Atleti played most or, or the entirety of last season. At, Atleti will play lazily for the for the entire 90 minutes. Then the 90 plus, they start getting energy and doing all that. And like, why not just take this game to, to them from the beginning? They are the underdogs, they are the favorites. Play this game like the favorites. Don't don't succumb to them, man. Yeah. I, I don't think Cadiz Cadiz have had up to two wins this season. No. And then no. go out, go out there against against a top against a top three team in the league. Yeah. And this is Cadiz's first home win of the season. The first home win of the season, which is craziness. And you look yeah, at Atleti, the, yeah. you look at Atleti, the way they performed away from home, the way they've gotten results at San Mamez, they've gotten results at the Venice of Marine. You would expect them to be stronger against Cadiz, but yeah. And it when is, won the league. Yeah, I was just going to say it is that. Is the small teams that just trip you up from nowhere, isn't yeah, it? True. <laughs> true. My point I was trying to make is when Atleti won the league, they were the opposite because they'll score once, they'll score the second one, then they'll relax a bit. And then if a team scored, they'll try to score the third goal, then relax. And that's what got them to the league. So it's just crazy that they've deviated from that like enthusiasm, that desire to really put a team on the sword. And it's costing them really much because I do feel they had a chance to even compete for this league, even despite what happened. But maybe after this cap the results, I think it's game over for them. Yeah, I feel I feel the focus at this point is third because 
Barca and Real Madrid keep getting results in the league and everything. Yeah, yeah not so much Real Madrid this weekend, though, against Girona. My my boys, Girona, who I absolutely do not hate, <laughs> come back and do the business against Real Madrid. Yeah. I think that was, that was Madrid's second, second game dropping points at the Benabao. So, Sassina and, and, to, and to Girona. It's terrible. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're leading... That, that, Really don't, don't forget that. Yeah, that's 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 the saddest thing for Ancelotti. Yeah, I have a question for both of you though, because I watched this game in the last twenty minutes, and from what I could see, it looked like in this game there was a different energy with Real Madrid. They feel they felt very low energy. I know they scored they scored as soon as they turned on the game, but. It just felt different, like they were super, like slow, like a desco, and I could feel that Girona were going to do something because they had like a couple chances. Even the penalty we'll get onto was controversial, but even after then, they had the chance to score the second. Um, I I think with with Madrid, yeah, even the reaction after the game, it it, it was clear that oh, you're just trying to grind out a win here. Yeah? Why blame the referee? Because that was a clear penalty, in my very honest opinion. And you are the Benabar, you are at home. You don't let Girona come up to you and bust your get opportunities or chances at some point in the game. And it, it does not it does not work out like that. I think the, the second goal for Rodrigo too that was cancelled out. The rules. Girona had a particular type of goal cancelled out last oh, yeah. week against Amira. Yeah. yeah, so I think it was it was all it was fair and square, you know. But like for Madrid, you, you, should, you should not undermine your opponents at all because they are newly promoted and all that. You should not give them spaces and all that. I think Madrid did, did go on to go down to 10 men. It's cruising the special card. But at, you are Madrid. You should control that game. You should have it at your fingertips. You should be in control. No, you're, you're definitely right. And Oscar, what do you think about penalty? Because I, I yeah. somewhat disagree with you, right? Because I felt it was a very harsh penalty to get. <laughs> Uh, I do expect me to say that Real Madrid shouldn't have because they feel like... <laughs> Okay. My first reaction was it's a penalty, but then when you look at it again, the, the thing is that it's one of those ones where you don't give the referee a decision to make. It's just, it's just it's kind of those middle ground ones. Yeah. Yeah, but I agree with that the Real Madrid. Real Madrid away from is perfect because how they play is suited better to away from home. But I feel like at home against teams that can that are organized and teams that also have a bit of quality to hurt them a little bit, they should be doing better than this. Yeah, they should. And that gave puts the opportunity for Barcelona because and that's why we have a very the Valencia Barcelona game. We expected fireworks, but at the end of the day, it was very scrappy. It was very, uh, there was very little chances there going on there. Lewandowski gets in a late, late goal. How how do you see the evolution of this game, Adira, from like three or four years ago when it was fireworks to now when it seems that Valencia, they were trying to hold on for a point? I think um, this thing, at, at, at the points in the game, you know, after, after this allowed goal for like, 5, 10, 15 minutes, Valencia go the Mojo back and yeah. try to at least see a goal and all that. But that, that did not materialize. And at the dying minutes, you know, they're playing against Barca with um, Lewandowski and Pedri, Dion, Gavi on the pitch, you know. It, I, I think it was a logical thing to do yeah. to just hold that for draw at the dying minutes. Very unfortunate that, that they had to lose in that, in that manner. But then, but, but Barca didn't really have any chance no. to, to close up that at all, except probably in the first half when that really came through against Ansu Fati. But Barca did not have any chance at all. They could not, they, there's no one that can tell me that Barca dominated that match all through 90 minutes. And I think that, 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 that's the difference between um, Gatsusu's Valencia and the one with Bordalas or Javi Garcia, where, where, where they give the opponents, regardless of the opponent chances to play, to donate them home or away. And like, yeah. Sad, sad to have, to have um, this thing. So I've left the the game with a loss. Yeah, yeah as you can see, the intent. Yeah. That's also against Athletic Club, Atletico Madrid, and um, Barca against these big teams that were 
that we could have said we were contesting for Europe with, you know, they have, they have taken the game to them. They have, they have not let down, they have not, they have not said, oh, you're bigger, you have better players, you're a better team, you know, you're more organized, there's a structure, we are going to allow you to meet us and so we're going to get from this game. Although three, three games, we lost all three, but then you could see the intent, you could see the passion from the players and all that, you know, yeah. and it's a great thing because this is, this is a project. I'm all on board this project. With time, we'll see, we'll see results from that as well. Yeah, and, and the one thing that really impressed me about this game from Valencia is that Valencia had a lot of central midfielders missing. For Kiat to play in center midfield, not his best position. EX was obviously not unavailable. Musa was unavailable, and that changes the dynamic of the team because I believe Musa, he's good in giving those passes, he's good being dynamic, making those runs. And Valencia really missed that, and I feel that's why maybe the approach is more conservative. Yeah, yeah, you can you can say so because with Fokia in the midfield, it was kind of like a, a distant, a short one situation because Clivet had to be had to be the one man marking Busquets yeah. to cut over and back backers and distribution channel. And I feel like the Nico Fier clause, he likes getting an injury on Tuesday. Um, he knew suspension did not help at all. So yeah. like the game for me, I think Valencia did pretty pretty well. The performance was okay despite having three midfielders out of the game. And yeah, you can you can give it to Gattuso. So I feel like if we did have someone like Musa Deroni wins while Busquets was down and being man marked, we would have come out with something in this game. We would have come out with something in the game with us. With 4K, it was just like, ah, oh, nah, this <laughs> midfield is non-existent. Yeah, and yeah. like, if, if you see, if you see it because the wingers, Clivet, you know, they, they had to take up different listening positions and Jody Alba and Baldi were free, free men running down running down the flanks every single minute till 90th minute. Yeah. It's kind of a disadvantage that Baka did not end up taking advantage of, you know. Yeah. But Oscar, from a Barca perspective, right, how do you see with all that's happened this week with Barca going out with Bayern, I think we saw one of the worst performances from Barcelona in La Liga this season in this game. Okay, yes, I don't think the performance was that bad. To be honest, I feel like Valencia. We have to credit them a lot. They really made they made a good game out of it. They competed. The quality wise, shots wise, the game wasn't there for either team. But uh, both team, I think I feel like Valencia really put a good challenge, and we. The one thing I liked was that we didn't give up, which we still tried and everything, even though it wasn't the forwards there at all. Well, just he came up with a important, it's an important goal, but to be honest, I didn't see him for 90 minutes. Yeah. So it was, it was that kind of game where, you know, we just had to try. And ultimately, I feel like if we if we end up winning the league or something, I'm not going to care about how badly or how well we played up instead because. It's a difficult place to come, and we're playing against a Valencia that you know actually tries to play football instead of Gattuso's Valencia. Sorry, <laughs> Bordalas. Sorry, Bordalas. No, no, no disrespect to Don Gattuso. Don Gattuso, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Lewandowski, right? He's been worth it given the money Barca's played for. If Barca are to win the league, this would be Lewandowski's league. Yeah, for sure. He's been. I mean, there are games where he's missed some big chances, but overall, you can't argue that this guy has been immense. Because remember last season, I always used to say, without a natural number nine, there are positions that our players just don't know how to get into. And that's the kind of position that you need a striker in. And it was good that he's able to get these goals. And given that Real Madrid also slipped up this weekend and we got a big win, I feel that this week was pretty good at the end. Yeah. Because the Champions League, I, I wrote that off. I've read that off since <laughs> then, so I didn't really care what happened. Is, is there an obligation for Barcelona to win the Europa League? To be honest, if you ask me, if you ask me, right, yeah. just lose the playoff and focus on the League and Cup. But here's the thing. Like I said last season, and these idiots didn't do it. Sorry for my language. If you win the Europa League, we avoid Bayern. So please, if you're not winning the league, win the Europa League. Because I was emphasizing this last year. 
<laughs> if we don't get the, if we don't win the Europa League, we're going to get drunk with Bayern again. <laughs> and every time we get drunk with these guys, we don't do anything like oh man. Historically, it's there. We've only beaten them like what twice. Yeah. And we needed Messi to be at at absolute god level to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not here anymore. So we need to if yeah. I know win the league, at least win the Europa League. Yeah, watch watch Bayern come second in the Bundesliga. Just drop oh, it. Oh, <laughs> crying out loud! Man. I'll just yeah. I'll just stop watching football. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, another big game this weekend was Real Sociedad versus Real Betis. I really enjoyed this game. It, it had like real fire to real sparks. Lack of goals until the last ten minutes, which is a, a classic in La Liga. The last ten minutes, you can choose not to work for Sadie. Watch the last ten and you see all the action. Betis gets in two goals. Alex Moreno was so brilliant on the left to give you assist. One Cruz gets in his first goal in La Liga. Uh, Betis, they look favorites for the top four right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Go, go on, Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, um, this thing, Sevilla's, Sevilla's downfall, Sevilla's drop in this thing, in performances and everything, gives an extra space for a like, Champions League spot. And I think Betis. It is a Sociedad to be fair because up until last week, Sociedad were like my favorite to get the extra spot. Until they lost, so I think that was Valladolid. Yeah. And then this back to back loss with Betis. I, I didn't expect Betis to get a win at Anweta, though. But yeah, it, it is what it is. But I think between Betis and Sociedad to get that extra top four space, I think it'll be very interesting to see, you know, with Atletico to probably Atletico falls off a wild shot and Betis and Sociedad go to the Champions League. You know, yeah, yeah, and and Oscar, what do you think about Betis this season? The evolution yeah. that they've made because yeah, they're not they're no longer a soft team. Yeah, they're not a soft team at all. They under Pellegrini, especially last season, they just grew from strength to strength. There, you can see there's a solid, there's a really good backbone in this team. You have Borja who's firing on all cylinders up front. You have the you have magicians in Canales and. Okay, you have a solid midfield too. And you have Alex Marino who is just getting better every season. Like this guy, he was very good at attacking wise, but the defensive part of the game was always lacking. But in the past 18 months, he's really improved there. And that has given real Betis a real edge. And sorry for the pun. <laughs> and honestly, I feel like right now. Given how the season has gone, if they finish third, it's going to shock me. But yeah. if they finish fifth this season, it's be a real disappointment. It really was. That said, it. also, one thing I really wanted from them this season was to top the European League group, and they've done that. So kudos to them. Yeah, kudos to them because they avoid the big coconuts of the failures of the Champions League that are coming for them, as Mourinho would say. <laughs> Even though Mourinho's team might get knocked out as well in the Europa League, but that's for later. <laughs> uh, I, it, I think one, one debate to be had is should Alex Moreno go to the World Cup with Spain ahead uh, of Jordi Alba? Honestly, is, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, point, I, yeah. say, I say yes, it's just that we know Luis Enrique, he likes his people. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, like, like Eric Garcia is still going to the World Cup. But based on form, I, was, I would argue Alec, uh, Alex Moreno is possibly the best. Left back in La Liga at the moment. Mm-hmm. I I disagree. I disagree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's it has to be Alex Marino. <laughs> I I know because uh, Gaia gave a really good performance against Barcelona. I, but... I think I think every every right winger Gaia has faced this season, he has locked every single one of them out. Every single one of them. Oscar, I, all of you could see Dembele. Dembele had little to no impact on on on, on Saturday. Yeah, that's Dembele. Dembele, Dembele goes about. from Maradona to <laughs> to Michael Phelps in one week. Yeah, I'm telling no. you, I'm telling you, every right winger in the league that guy has faced this season, it means the first four four matches of the season. But Luis Enrique still called him up to that and the Nations League matches and all that. But yeah, every right winger he has faced this season. He has looked every single one of them out. I think the World Cup play back spaces is, yeah. Do, do you know? Do you know what? I'll say from a defensive point of view, Gaia is like infinitely better than Alex Moreno. But I'll say offensively, Alex Moreno possibly has that. He has that bit of magic that I feel 
Gaia has lost over the years. Like he used to have that when he was younger and it was coming up. I remember that game against Madrid where Valencia beat Carlo and Chelsea's Madrid after a long spell of not losing. And Gaia's like he's lost that offensive edge that they used to have. That's I think I'm when when you play for Bodala San Garcia for two consecutive years, I think you, you lose your attacking edge. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's wrong. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah, but do you guys know who Betis are playing next week? Sevilla. Oh, Sevilla. Man. Oh, man. Now, watch <laughs> Sevilla turn up and beat Betis up there. Uh, yeah. yeah, Sevilla, like, it, their home form is outrageous. They haven't won at home in La Liga. They're bottom of the table. Rayo... It's, it's really poor considering the people they faced in that, in that period. Yeah, yeah. They faced, like, by the lead, Rayo. Like, you'd expect them to win against them. <laughs> Hope you, Rayo's Rayo is a very strong team this season. I remember the lead at 11, so. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, that, no, that table lies, because it's like there's five points between Sevilla and Valencia. True, true. true. I, I, I think one, one, one interesting thing about this season is that it is very open. From aside Madrid and Barca, from maybe Atleti down to Valladolid. And then in the in mid table, it is very open. You have Rai Valicano, Osasuna fighting for European places this season. It is one interesting season that will go long, and it all depends on people that can finish it well after the winter break, after the World Cup break, that can keep up their form and all that. Yeah, Rai really surprises me because, like Oscar, I expected them to be, to fall off a bit this season. I expected them to be closer to where Celta is at the moment, but they've just gone from strength to strength. It just shows you. How good of a manager Raiola is, and Raiola... when, when you have Isi Palazon, it's <laughs> always an advantage. True, sure. and they're going to get Raude Tomas in January. So imagine how stacked this team is going to be. Yeah, if the, if Raude Tomas can come in and gel, and everyone makes him, everyone is happy. And they, if they get seventh or sixth, it won't shock me because these guys are playing really well. Like you have Katana. Uh, Katana is one we really need to highlight because this guy is one of Spain's most underrated centre backs, and you have the gym next to him who <laughs> has scored braces for fun, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> so, the next, yeah. the next Ronald Koeman. Yeah, so it's good to see Ryu do well, and they've gone to Barca, Atleti, and I know Sevilla, Sevilla, but still, they've gone to these three places and not lost. I feel that deserves a lot of praise. Yeah, it really does. But with Sevilla, though, next weekend, is this going to be a three in a row? Or should we expect Betis to win 4 0 or something? Because Betis on the Pellegrini, they haven't beaten Sevilla in La Liga. They won't, they've beaten them in Copa del Rey, but in La Liga. So will that change on Sunday? I know that we joked about Sevilla turning up, but what are they going to turn up with this time? Because the thing is that you can. You can you can this thing you can feed the horse, but if the horse can't run. There's nothing to do. So I feel we might see a heavy trash or something <laughs> for you know this. So can can I tell you guys a story here? Story time. Yeah. Let, let's go back to 2014. Betis were atrocious in the league. They were having a terrible season in the league. Sevilla did thrash them in the first derby, but they were they almost knocked Sevilla out of the Europa League in 2014, and they were like rock bottom of the table. Like they needed to get to penalty. So this derby has put up so many surprises. It's one of the most intriguing ones, although it is so one-sided in recent years. But I won't be surprised if we see it split. Yeah. If Betis don't win this game, they, they should just stop playing football. Because <laughs> there is no there's no better time to not just beat, but I mean really, really stomp on your rivals. Because yeah. they, they just have to at this point. So, yeah, at, at, at what point should we start worrying about relegation? Because I'm genuinely starting to look and like, if you can't beat these teams at home, and to be fair to Sevilla, it's not like having Rafa Mir miss two big chances in the space of a second help. So, <laughs> I don't know if somebody doesn't start scoring this, you know, if San Paulo doesn't just pick. A proper lineup, it's going to be trouble. 
Yeah, they definitely need to invest in January. I'm not sure whether they have the money to it, but they definitely need to, because this reminds me of uh, Villarreal in 2012. It reminds me a lot about that. It reminds me of Villarreal and Athletic Club in 2018, or 20, 2018-2019, where they both almost got relegated and sell to two. So I, I wouldn't be surprised because, and I, I've been saying this all season, the one thing about the Sevilla side is they lack a soul. They don't, they give up so easily. They have no fights in them. And it's worrying time. Sao Paulo said they took a step back. I, I agree with that as well. And I'm, I am worried for Sevilla, but at the same time, I like as Adora said, this league is so open that three, four wins. And before you know it, they're like fighting for seventh, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, let's move on to Athletic versus Villarreal because those are two teams that in this open league could, could fight for the Champions League. And Athletic, they, it was a game of two halves almost because I felt Villarreal under Setien, who was making his debut, was very good in the first 30 minutes. But in the second half, it was a, it was a masterclass from Atleti. They were, it was a monologue almost. Right, Adira? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm just been... It's um it's it's only a case of um the team that was more um used to the present to their coach at that moment and more used to the philosophies, the tactics and all that, you know, more like a new environment for Villarreal players, you know, having to keep the ball every single time and not being conservative conservative like under Emery. Yeah. And like, you know, I think that was like the highest possession in in a league game for Villarreal in their history. Wow. Um highest number of passes they've had in a league game. And it was very funny, but Again, Naki Williams coming through, and which is surprising because he's having a monstrous season this season in terms of goal, um, goal contribution and the amount of goals scored, you know. And, yeah. and, and it's really nice to see that Valverde is actually bringing out the best name, you know. Yeah, and, and last time he had such a great season, that was under Valverde as well. So, and have you noticed a change in how Atletico have played from Valverde to Marcelino? Yeah, yeah, there, 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 there's, there's been a very, um, a very big change. To be very honest with you, you know, Marcelino is not, is not the type of coach to attack, or to set his team out to attack, or to have a lot of possession, you know, like a, like with Valencia, too, you know, play four four two, the um, this thing, defend, you know, just, just do, do not make errors, sit back, and just play on the counter attack, you know. And I think that's not what Athletic Club needed. The type of players they had in, um, Munyai, Berengue. In Aki Williams, you know, they needed someone to tell them that go out on the front foot, attack, use your abilities to the best. And that's what Vavede has given this team, you know. Likes of Oya and um, Sanchez, Sanchez too. Oh, Sanchez man. is just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful midfielder. Do I call him a midfielder or a striker? He, like watching him play is like this, this Spanish Zidane. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the best Zidane is very. Just, oh, God. His balance is incredible. I, I didn't like Oscar. Did you see something like this come from Sunset last season? Because oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, not not as a midfielder though, but last season when he was popping up with goals as a secondary striker, I felt I, second striker. someone is someone that can, you know, add in goals where Inaki Williams couldn't last season. But hey, everyone is chipping in, and you know, if I I said at the beginning of the season, if all of Athletics forwards chipping with five extra goals they really go for it this year yeah and how do you rate them in terms of finishing in top four because there is a top four race to be won by them it's possible but i just feel i feel athletic and betis are stronger than them so yeah. it's it'll be i but definitely i feel athletic will finish can finish above above their neighbors from the vast country yeah, uh, and let's let's talk about Setien because he's coming into Villarreal from Unai Emery, who had such a masterful career there, won them the first title. How big of a job is this for him in terms of changing his reputation, given what happened with Barcelona, what happened in the Bayern Munich game? Is this a make it or break it for him? I, can't, I don't think you can see that because I'm actually surprised he took a job in football again. Because <laughs> in his many post match, his many interviews since leaving Barca, he was like, I'll never coach again or something. But I feel this is an opportunity for him to, you know, just get back out there, enjoy coaching and enjoy football. Yeah. I, I, also, oh, I agree with you. Go on, go on. 
I agree so with you, Felicio. It's a it's a great job in terms of lack of pressure. The one thing mm-hmm. like Pellegrini at Betis, where it was like a perfect job because the pressure is not too high mm-hmm. at Villarreal. Like if you finish sixth every year, you've done a great job. You don't need to mm-hmm. win a trophy. If you're playing beautiful football and you're entertaining people, like and you have a supportive family club where they be very patient with you. So, yeah. I feel it's a really good job for him, like you said, and he has a pretty good chance to even win European silver because you Villarreal are true to the Conference League knockout. So we'll see how it goes. I just feel like Adura was saying, the team is going to have to take time to adjust to his more um, possession-based style. As against them, we were, they were happy to be conservative a few times. Yeah, and I noticed that in the game because there were a few times when the, the Villarreal players got caught up by Athletic's high pressure because they were spending too much time on the ball because usually they used to like punt in it and you could tell, like even Paul Terra sometimes is like, should I punt it up? Should I pass it? And it was sort of stuck in two minds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it'll be interesting with Jared Moreno because they've loved each other ever since Setien was in Lugo and Setien tried to sign Jared Moreno to Betis so it's like after they've signed, it's like, yeah, we're finally going to be able to work together with each other. So I'm mm-hmm. excited to see that. But let's talk about Osasuna. As Adura said, they've been outperforming this season in La Liga. They got back 2 0 win against Valladolid, and it really should have been 4 or 5. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think I'm just saying, Arasati has been giving time to build this thing, to get his ideas to these players, and, you know, yeah. A project. You have been giving time to build the project. As the Betis director, I mean, Osasuna directors came out today in a, um, this in a conference and said, yeah, they are pretty happy with what Arasate is in and the confidence they've transferred into him and all that, you know. He's, he has done a really, really great job. And from, coming from the second that three seasons ago, now they are competing for European places. Who could have thought, you know, great yeah. recruitment, likes of Chimi Avila, Kiki Garcia, Ante Budimir. Kiki Garcia might be aging, but he has a La Liga experience. He has an imposing presence of, of, the, of the field and all that, you know. Yeah. And they are really doing great. Yeah. And they're one of the teams that I'll say they play the most like Real Madrid in, in the entire league in that they're more athletes in terms of how they play, in terms of the pressure as well. So it's they're a great team to watch when they're on form. I watched them in the first, the first match against Sevilla and I was like, wow, this is... An amazing team, and you see the way the fans are. It's really such a good fertile story for La Liga. Yeah, yeah, yeah the atmosphere, you know. I, I feel like um, this thing, Elsa, Elsa, that I, I recently I, I, I read somewhere, Elsa, that has loudest and this thing, loudest atmosphere, like in, in top five European leagues, you know. Wow. The team is behind, the fans are behind the team, you know, they are, they are invested in the project, you know. They know, yeah, this is the right person to lead us. We have belief in our players. We're, we're going to support our team with downs or lose and all that. And it is really paying off, you know. I'm really yeah. glad to see, see, see a club in the type of mentality and, and all that, you know, yeah. trying to make, make it in for themselves and trying to fight for those European places. These are the things that make the league, that, that makes the league more interesting, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I feel like this fairy tale story, I might be biased because I like them, but I feel it deserves it. Conference league place at least. I don't think they'll get it because the competition is really steep, but Arasate deserves Arasate and Asasuna fans deserve European nights because they're really like Adora said, this whole fan base, the players, everything, you can really sense the togetherness. Yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. I, I remember a couple of seasons back when Asuna they were so close to they could qualify for the Champions League, but they got knocked out in the third. Play third and the third round playoffs, but it'll be nice to see them being in Europe again, like or in two thousands when they got to the semifinals of the UEFA Cup. That will pretty be sweet. Uh, let's move on to Almeria versus Celta Vigo, and Chachi Kude is in big, big trouble. Gabby Vega scoring an amazing goal for Gasena, and Hot Almeria, coach. Almeria, man, it's at first they couldn't score without Sadik, and now every home game it's like they're scoring three goals. <laughs> yeah, talk about the change of fortunes, and that's what you get when you're patient. Because it's what the easy thing to do would have been to sack Ruby, even though we all have said 
this summer wasn't his fault because he took a risk at the, at the last minute. But he's been giving time. The signing, the many signings they've made, have started gelling together. You know, Fernando has stopped making mistakes because he's not playing again. <laughs> and yeah, well, it's it's good to see that they're defining expe my expectations because I was like, given the way the summer ended, I could have seen them in Sevilla's position right now, but they're doing pretty good for themselves. Yeah, and it's funny the approach they took because they went for youth. Then later on, it's almost like as if they were like, "Oh, okay." this youth thing might not be the right approach at this moment. Let's just go for experience first and slowly but surely bring in the youth. Like you have guys like Vinicius Lazaro who came on, he scored his first goal in La Liga, but they have also experienced heads like someone like Batistao has been so important for them. I believe he got two assists today. Diego Sosa yeah. got an assist. And these are experienced players. Yeah. Malera has also really been good for them as well. Yeah, I, 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 I think Malera has been their most important player this season. Yeah. Beside El, El Bilal Ture, you know, and Akiemi too, the former Barca, Barca Academy graduate. But, it, but it, the main thing that helped Almeria, you know, recently was the change of system from the 3 4 3 to the 4 2 3 1 with Malera as number 10 and Mbaba and Babsta on the right, you know. The change of system has really, really, really helped them, especially in their own games, you know, yeah. and all that, you know. And, 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 and again, as I've said, the league is very open. Things like this, like generally in La Liga before, you see this type of thing trying to, to sit back and just defend games and watch their, their opponents or the most superior teams play them out and all that, you know. But now they're taking the games to them and like, oh yeah, we believe in ourselves. We can play the same game we are playing. So I'm like, bring it to us, we bring it to you, you know. And it's really great to see, you know. Yeah. The Raul Valicano game was one surprising one, you know, like, oh yeah, the Raul last game, they're going to outplay Amelia, you know. Team wasn't scored since Sadiq and he popped three goals. <laughs> Very surprising. Very on um, this thing, I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment on Celta. Here we go. I think banning Denis Suarez because of a 12 year old boys transfer has really caused the team as of now. There is no there is no creator in that team and it is yeah. affecting them. It's going to affect the next money that they sign in the sack Chacho Kude to. It's going to affect the next and the next and the next. Yeah. It's a very stupid decision by, by the coach president. Yeah, it, it is because he, he went for this approach of I'm going to reform this team entirely, which is fine. But why why let someone who's like Dennis Suarez go? Or I'm sorry, someone like Bryce Mendes go and banish Dennis Suarez from the team because these are your two best players. These are the guys who linked so well with Aspas that made Celtic such a great team. But with someone like Dennis Suarez, who's worth like 12 to 20 million euros, you're essentially letting him go for free. You're shipping him around. Right. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's most likely it's most likely going to leave this January or, or by the end of the transfer window for free, and it's pointless. Rizmendes, they sold for 14 million, did not properly replace him. He's one of the best players in La Liga currently. One of the best players in La Liga currently. One of the most influential players we have in the league currently is Bryce Mendes. These yeah. are the type of players Celta are missing, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is, but. We'll have to keep an eye out for that situation and see how that evolves. Espanyol, they're another team that I don't think did very well in transfer in transfer market, and it's showing for them. This game was also controversial, the Mario Kart Espanyol game, because of a penalty. Mario Kart, I believe, they get the first goal. Espanyol equalizes them. There's a late penalty because there's a challenge on, on hell. And for some reason, VAR looks at it, but they don't give that penalty. Can someone tell me why? Because Spanish referees are stupid. <laughs> no, that that's just the truth. It's like the the amount of time we spend talking about controversial decisions is too much. And I said, like they need to come out and start explaining. Okay, they don't have to be giving post match interview, but you have to come out and at least give people reasons. Like, why are we doing this? Because keeping people in the dark will make everyone come up with all sorts of ideas as to why you're not giving teams decisions and whatnot. And it's just very poor. Like as fans of the league, we want to see teams, you know, get their views and everything. Yeah, does it Oscar, you, like, you know, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be straightforward with you and tell you like the problem is just Rubiales. You cannot have Rubiales editing this <laughs> and think that you don't make good decisions <laughs> you can wake up. 
I probably oh, yeah, you're a Valencia fan. I understand why you don't like you. Probably with Real. Yeah, and I, I can't say I can't say you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, because this season they've given the referee on the pitch more power to like make decisions to have more control. But sometimes the referee on the pitch is wrong. And that's why you bring in VAR. I would almost like it if there was no VAR. <laughs> and at least we won't get this like double jeopardy of error of error making. Okay, yeah, you know, you, 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 have, you, have, you have a very great point because there is VAR. Go and check the VAR. The VAR, the VAR, the VAR is to assist you in making these decisions. But you just said, oh, no, I'm not going to check VAR for this decision. The same thing happened on Saturday. Marcos Alonso's tentacle of Marcos Andre. A clear card. I was given the yellow card, and the ref refused to check VAR at all. Like, yeah. Why? 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 The device is there for you to check it. Yeah, I almost wish like there was an American football style of thing where, like, first of all, the referee is communicating in the open, like, how is this your making process for each VAR decision, and also the the coaches had like an option to put their handkerchief down and be like, the ref has to check VAR for this because I believe this could be life-changing for our team. Because I'm like the Marcus Andre one. I'm sure if the referee sees that again, he could give a red card. Or that penalty to Mallorca, if the referee goes and sees it, he would give the penalty. So something like that. Like if Aguirre is like so sure. And now with like the with online, with the internet and everything, the players have access to the replays as much as we do. <laughs> so they can see a bad decision from a mile away. So yeah. Okay, now that we're done with La Liga business, who was the best performing player and the best performing team this week? Uh, I think I'd say it's, okay, I'll say best performing player is Alex Marino. And I'll give best performing team to Real Betis because they played against an important rival and I've picked them to fourth place for now. Yeah. In, in, my, in my opinion, I think the best performing player was Espino mm. of Cadiz. Yeah. yeah. That's a good yes. one. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give any best performing team to be fair. Yeah, but I've said I'm very happy. Yeah, that, that's fair. For me, I'll say I'll, I'll agree with you. Agree. The best performing player was Espino because he was so good against Atleti. I think for team, I'll go with I'll go with Athletic Club because I was just. just in fact, that game, watching that game was like breathtaking because it was played at such a fast pace. It was super entertaining. It's one of those games where like you're watching and you don't want to look at your phone or anything because you're like, this is like, and in the second half, they could have scored like three or four. So I was super impressed with the performance. But let's move on to Serie A where Milan, Lazio all lost. <laughs> and it seems like Napoli have extended the lead to five points there. Yeah, the Lazio loss to Salentana or Salentana, yeah, was very surprising. At, at home, you know, you're losing 3-1 to Salentana. And um, La Liga boy, like, yeah, got, got a goal for Salentana yesterday against Lazio. It's very funny, you know, because in the Europa League too, Lazio have been kind of like flopping, you know, up and down, losing to Michelin 4-1 or thereabouts. And like, it's a very bad image for Sarri, in my very honest opinion, you know. Yeah. You have the players, you have the team, you have immob- they had immobility open to the point. I think he, he, he has got some injured, you know. Yeah. But you have the players. You have Milinkovi Sadvic, Luis Alberto, Felipe Anderson, Sakagni. Like, you should be performing way better than this. And what's funny is, Lazio's group in the Europa League is the most open group in European Championships this season. You know, oh, with three yeah. teams on like six or eight points. I'm missing... All four teams there have a, a chance of qualifying to the next stage. Yeah, it's like Spurs is in the Champions League. Yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be happening, especially given the fact that it is a lower level competition in the Europa League. But that's that's the problem. But what about Napoli? They've been super impressive. Like, do you think they can actually finish uh, top of win Serie A and finish on top of the Champions League group? You know, that's true. The, the okay. main uh, issue is. She, sorry, I'm going going to, yeah, no, I'm going to be okay. sorry. Okay. I was saying at this rate, with how good they've been, I'm pretty, I'm more and more confident that they can actually win this team because defensively they're top, 
attacking wise, they're just scoring goals for fun. And even if you compare them to their nearest rival in Atlanta, Atlanta are kind of different in that from what they used to be in that they're not scoring that much, but they're it's very solid. But Napoli, they just have everything and they can hurt you in so many ways. And yeah, I feel they can do both things, like you said, Touch. Yeah, and the thing is, we don't really realize is they have the same record as Real Madrid so far. We've been waxing their record about them all season. And so it'll be nice to see them finally get, get over the line, win Serie A, do it for the late departs at Diego Maradona. Juventus, I would like to speak to them because they had they had an interesting game against Benfica midweek. It seemed like they were going to get absolutely destroyed, but they came back. Uh, what changes for Juve? Should Allegri go by November, by the time the World Cup comes? Oscar? I think, yeah... I feel like you should have gone so, so this week. <laughs> but it, the thing is that I feel you may, if, if they, are you may, I feel you may have wanted to sack him, but they just don't have the facilities to do that right now. So they're just like, let's, let's unfortunately stick with what we have until maybe this summer and then see what we can do. Yeah. And Adore, you're about to make a point on that. Um, yeah, like, why stick with him? It, it is very obvious that this is a very, very bad project with Allegri. There's no point in it. He's, he's not doing anything great with the team. He has, he has the team, and the Champions League was just a disaster. A disaster. Pure disaster. Very terrible. And you know there's a problem when, after every match, the directors have to come out and tell the media that, yeah, we're still backing our coach and all that. Almost after every single game. There becomes a problem. There's a problem. There's a clear problem they're hiding from you. Know? Yeah, yeah. There is. There is another team going. Moving on to England, the team having a clear problem right now is Liverpool in the domestic league. They lost again to Leeds. My boy Rodrigo scoring a goal. I'm happy about that. But but what's been wrong with this team domestically? Oscar, are you going to speak this? I honestly don't know how, how to take this. That's the thing I was waiting for you to do. Because okay. yeah, in Europe, it seems like things are working okay. But it's just they can't keep, they can't get results. Is this Jurgen Klopp's seven-year curse? I, I, I don't know how to explain it because they defeated Man, Man City, you know. They yeah. beat Man City. Very wonderful performance to defeat Man City. Then the next game, you lose Nottingham Forest and you get your initial candidates. <laughs> What's wrong? Is, is, is it a mental problem or do we just blame it on the injuries, lack of midfielders, you know, yeah. or probably luck? Yeah. It's very unfortunate. The, the thing is that, then again, in terms of, I'm sorry to interrupt, in terms of injuries, they're not doing as badly as they were a month ago, where you could definitely say, yeah, they're really having an injury crisis. So now, I just don't know, like, they're playing a pretty strong team every week. Yes, we're still having these weird results. Yeah. The one team that's not having weird results is Arsenal. They won 5-0 pretty convincingly. And you know what? Like, I remember saying, Ars- talking about Arsenal a couple of weeks ago, you laughed, Oscar, but like, they're still here. They're still top. They're still, we're still talking about them. Yeah, we have to give them their credits. It's, it's been a very good, last, since last season, Atata has really steadied the ship and like Adora has mentioned the project, if you st- sometimes having faith in your manager it really pays off in the long run. And yeah. yeah, they're still first. Nasty haven't Nasty are still winning, but they haven't caught up with them yet. We'll see how things go because that's a really interesting development over there in England. Yeah, and uh, Chelsea, they got a surprise lacking by my Brighton after taking their manager. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that, that, this is all the TG love about football. Yeah. Uh, even in uh, Emery like he started poorly in, in England too he got he also got shellacking as well so not, against not the team think... that he was linked with last year. <laughs> <laughs> Emery, 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 Emery is just going to resume tomorrow. That's Tuesday, right? Emery is yeah. going to resume his job. So, like, um, Aaron Danks took over that game yeah. yesterday or two days ago. But, like, then again, yeah, 
I feel like Emery has Emery has put himself in a um, what I call it in a delicate situation. He could have joined Newcastle and built a team from the preseason, from summer, and built the type of team he wants to take into the season. But taking over before the World Cup break doesn't seem to be the best decision to make in my very honest opinion. No. But he did take instead of joining Newcastle, he did reach a semi-final for the first time in his life in the Champions League. So yeah. But I, I guess if I were Emery, I would I would actually want to go for the Juventus job. Because you look at going to Juve, you look at them and if you get a manager like Unai Emery, you can bring back the old Juventus, like a structured team that can attack uh-huh. and that can do very well in Europe. And I, I believe they have the same obsession because Juve have this obsession of winning the Champions League. Yeah, at 4 for 2 as well. <laughs> <laughs> and and I mean, Champions League. Emery, he wants to be... He's, he's known as the Europa League manager, but he wants to be a Champions League winner. Uh-huh. And so I, I thought that would have been the perfect match for him. Yeah. But you know, release clauses and all that. Yeah, yeah. And let, let's move on over to the Bundesliga. Union Berlin, they, they continue surprising us. They're still on top of the Bundesliga. They need to stop surprising us. <laughs> <laughs> they need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was on board the Union Berlin train until this week. I've had enough. Please let by her with <laughs> 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 oh man, Bayern though they won six two against Mainz uh, after their stroll against Barcelona. Let them keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Dortmund they won two one against Eintracht Frankfurt, who are in an interesting group in the Champions League. Very interesting group. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like the group that last year is in in Europe because Spurs they they bottled it against Sporting. So right now it's like anyone in that group can finish first, second, third, or fourth. So that will be interesting to watch. And yeah. who are you guys going for? Uh, I'll go for. Hold on, let me let me see again. Let me see who's playing who because I I believe it's Spurs versus Marseille in France. And Spurs, and... Spurs, Spurs, Spurs for sure. And then um, I'll say Spurs and Sporting. The top two sides. Okay. Well, one 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 thing that that's always been clear is that Conte is not a Champions League manager. It's not the best manager for cup competition, so it's a very yes, tricky thing. To be fair. I said that about yeah. Inter, but look at what happened. Yeah, but, but to be fair, it's like you're you're going the Conte curse versus the Marseille curse. Which one is going to yeah. <laughs> which one's going to win out? Because <laughs> Marseille are terrible in Champions League as well. But they've gotten more points in this, and what uh, they've gotten more points in this edition than all the other editions they've been <laughs> combined. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That's terrible. Yeah, and, and also another factor is like going away in Europe is super tough. And with that crowd in Marseille, I'm sure it's going to be a capacity crowd. You yeah. might be surprised. Another thing, uh, the other thing was why I said Spurs would probably beat Marseille is because Marseille have been in poor form recently since they beat Sports and they haven't won a game. And they drew this last week again, weekend against Strasbourg. So I don't know, I feel. Tottenham get the job done, and then Sporting. I feel Sporting is stronger than Frankfurt. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'll i agree with you on that. And moving on to France, finally, PSG. They keep on entertaining us in France. France is actually coming an entertaining league actually with the games. Like you see, four threes, two threes every week. Carlos Soler is finally scoring. Adore, do you think that was the right move for him? Um. I'll be I'll be honest with you and tell you that I don't think that was the right move for him because at Valencia it was the main focus, focal point of the thing, you know, all the attention, being baby, being protected, you know. He's not going to get a PSG, you know. Yeah. There are a lot of stars. And any anything happens and is out of the thing for good. It's out for good, you know. And there's no protection whatsoever and all that. But then there's a Spanish connection with a lot of Spanish players there. So to be a very comfortable environment for him and all that. Hopefully. Yeah. He gets his best. Well, he's getting his mojo, you know. A goal in the Champions League, then a start, a very rare start in the league for him. And another goal. Very beautiful taking goal, to be fair. Yeah, extremely. Uh, yeah, I also feel like the fact that PSG have switched from five defenders and are using 
the 200 midfielders that we brought this <laughs> summer will be, will be better for him because there's too many talented midfielders that just keep, keep on the bench and play five defenders, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I've also seen that um, the PSG, they've been changing it up in terms of formation, so it's good to have that flexibility. Because in Champions League knockout runs, we can be in different situations, but having something to fall back on will definitely help you. Yeah, and, and also with PSG, they're going to Italy this week, this week with the hope of finishing first. And that first place might be in danger if they lose to Juventus, but do, you, do both of you see that happening? Or is, <laughs> no. Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe uh, against Juve. But I have a question. This is a moral question. Would they want to play this game? Because this game is just like we're going to either we're finishing first, and the World Cup is in two or three weeks. I, I feel I, that I, I, I feel they don't they don't take any risk and just get the job done. Okay. Adira. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. You know, it's very clear. You know, you you either take first place and play a, a smaller opposition in the round of sixteen, or you risk it, you play your sub um, second choice and play a tough opposition in the round of 16. Yeah. Most you know. Yeah. Yeah. But even with the second place team, I don't, I'm not sure because I was out of it last week, but Real Madrid, some, Real Madrid could take second. Liverpool or Napoli could take second. Yeah. So you I, can I, still. I, I, no, I don't know, Oscar, because I feel like this is one of those Champions Leagues where the second place team is much rooted in the first place team because in the first place team you could have like Bayern, PSG, Real Madrid, Napoli, um, Chelsea, City. So yeah. it's like very strong. And the second place yeah. teams like they're not they're not as strong in my opinion as yeah. other seasons. Yeah, but a couple of them can still finish second depending yeah. on how things go. Yeah, that, that that's very true. That's very true. And with that, I would like to thank Adura for joining us on this emergency podcast to discuss Nice football. Oscar, your soldier, what, what will I do without you? Thank you for being here. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Yeah. And adios, guys.